Welcome to Texans Unfiltered. And here we go, here we go! A Houston football podcast for your Houston Texans. Hot, hot! All right, guys, welcome back to another edition of Texans Unfiltered. A special edition with our friend uh, Zach Hicks from Stampede Blue. Uh, you ha- guys have had him, heard him uh, in the offseason when we did our Colts um, little recap of their offseason, things like that. Zach and I are always interacting on Twitter. Definitely one of the best followers you can follow on Twitter when it comes to film reviews uh, on things like that. So uh, make sure you guys give Zach a follow. And Zach, I'll just let you introduce yourself where they can find you on Twitter and all that good stuff. Yeah, guys, uh, if you uh, remember from the offseason, uh, you know, I'm a big Colts guy, but uh, I do do a lot of uh, film room stuff on other teams as well. Uh, it's over on at Zach Hicks, too, on Twitter. Very interactive on there. Uh, but glad to be back on the show, man. I'm glad that, uh, you know, it's after a Colts win, too. So, uh, you know, so I'm the one in good spirits <laughs> instead of you. It's uh, feels good. Feels good. Yeah, you know, it's funny. You, uh, you, you, uh, you tweeted out earlier this week about um, – and this is a place where I find myself now, um, where being a journalist and then also being a fan mm-hmm. and being able to divide the two, uh, you know, I started this just because I was a fan. And now as we're growing and other opportunities are, are you know, coming, it's it's almost like made me question, like, which way do I go? Yeah. Because that's not how it started for me. I didn't do it to have a career. I did it because I just wanted to talk about it but i just thought that tweet was very interesting yeah well uh the two things to that will be one i mean podcasting is a little different from writing for instance especially what i do you know i do a lot of film breakdowns uh and even though there is some opinion mixed into it there's a lot of you know kind of stating what you're seeing and i try not to let fandom kind of sneak into that even though you know i never grew up a fan of the colts i like the colts don't get me wrong and i hope they win every single week because it just makes my job easier but you know it, it when you're doing kind of the film work like I do, it's you, you never really want that fandom to slip in. You don't want the bias to slip in. You don't want to say stuff that's not happening due to fandom. Whereas, you know, podcasting, like what you guys are doing, you can kind of let fandom slip in a little bit. That's, some, that's where you get some of your best bits, you know, is from fandom and from, you know, overreactions and stuff. I remember when I was doing Locked on Redskins a couple of years ago, uh, I recorded an instant analysis thing to the Alex Smith trade right when it happened. And I was like four beers in, like I should not have been recording <laughs> that night. It was a horrible decision, but it was like the most traffic I ever got. So it's a little different with podcasting and, and you know, like writing like film rooms and stuff. But, um, you know, I, I try not to let bias sneak, sneak in at all. It's tough. Uh, I, I really have to give credit to the Redskins for, you know, my childhood team just being an utter chaos, terrible organization. Uh. It, it's killed my fan, like killed my fandom for just, football team in general so uh you know props where it's due there and they've they've really helped me uh clear up any bias uh, (laughs) when it comes to rooting for teams (laughs) yeah i mean the redskins right now are i would say the literal laughing stock of the entire nfl right now and and that's saying a lot because miami is just (laughs) utter garbage Redskins are trying though. So that's what makes it That's worse. what makes it worse is that the Redskins are trying. Um yeah, I I don't know. I feel bad for for any fan of the Redskins. And then you take hey, Dwayne, that whole Dwayne Haskins fan. thing. Ugh. Yeah. No, as a Washington fan, at least I got the Nationals and it's great to say this on a Houston podcast. Oh, I got no. the Nationals. Oh, uh which is no. they looking like the the team of destiny like what we said with the Caps last year or 2 years ago. So uh, at least every other sport in Washington is doing well enough to where we can kind of ignore the, you know, Dan Snyder and the Redskins for a bit. But I don't want to get too much into Washington sports or the Nats, you know, uh, beating the Astros two games to zero in the oh, World Series. But uh, uh, yeah, no, that, that, I mean, going back to the bias thing, though, again, that, that just um, I try not to let bias sneak in. It, it's tough, but um, it, it really clouds your judgment sometimes when it comes to this kind of stuff. One thing I've realized, though, about bias in in general when it comes to like this and what I found, at least with myself, is um, I think like there's certain fans of teams that do these types of podcasts and journalism, and they're just not realistic fans from the beginning. Yeah, Um, they you know, they're always drinking from the hose. They're all it's always Kool-Aid. And then there are some who and I think I would put myself in this group. I have no problem criticizing the team. I have no problem second guessing what they're doing. 
I, I mean, I, I, I try to, I, I don't know if bias has ever leaped in. You know what? I'll say, I'll take that back. Bias crept in last week when I predicted that we would beat the Colts. And, <laughs> and, and that was just because I started to think that maybe BOB is capable of at least being a little bit better than what we, what we've seen from his best against you guys, which unfortunately, and it's a perfect segue, you know, Frank Reich is, I think he's, I think he's the head coach of the year candidate. I, I honestly think he's probably the top candidate, to be honest with you. I don't. I know Sean Payton and what he's doing with with Teddy Bridgewater is being thrown around as as why. But when you look at that team and compare the Saints to what they've built in Indy, I, I just I don't think that you could take the off season that the Colts had and expect the results that we're getting. Mm-hmm. Like you, you have a top three quarterback retire. Yep. And you have a guy who nobody thinks coming into the season is a franchise guy before this game, you and I have talked and you know, you didn't think Jacoby was the guy you're ready for Joe Burrow. And, and I'm assuming a lot of the fan base probably felt the same way, but when you look at how they win, it's pretty much all X's and O's schemes and game plans. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's very impressive. Frank Reich is a damn good coach. I mean, it's a, Again, going back to my Washington fandom growing up, as I transitioned from a fan, a little kid fan watching sports every weekend to now being a writer for another team, I've never seen a coach like this, like up, you know, up close and personal, you know, uh, going from that franchise to this one, uh, especially now as a writer and kind of following the team closer. I mean, I've never seen a coach like Frank Reich where, uh, you know, from the ability to motivate and get his guys ready every single week, he's top notch. From the ability to to scheme, uh, not only scheme like guys open in the passing game, but no, you know, going into the Chiefs game, uh, we're going to pound it out. We're going to control the clock. We're going to not let Pat Mahomes touch the ball and then completely mix it up the next week against a really good Texans team and say, hey, they're expecting us to run it and control the clock. We're going to throw it all over them now. Uh, so being able to be versatile with the scheme, uh, he's very analytics heavy. I mean, he goes for it on fourth down more than any other coach. Uh, it's got the, I mean, we saw last year against the Texans last year. He's not afraid of making that risky call and, and the players back him up for it. Uh, there's just so many aspects to Frank Reich that make him such a great coach. Uh, I mean, I, I've yet to see, you know, especially this year, even most of the time last year, him really get out coached. Like you just rarely see that. Maybe his guys will get beat on the field. Uh, but you will rarely see him out coach. And I think, you know, the NFL changes so much from year to year to, you know, season to season. But I think we're seeing the beginnings of a, of a great coach. I mean, I think he's he's just on that climb. And I don't see any way of him going, you know, like Matt Nagy last year, I think he was the coach of the year. You could kind of see aspects where that could kind of falter. Uh, Frank Reich, you don't really see it. I don't know. I I, I just see it. Maybe, I, maybe that's my bias lens. But uh, I, I don't see this train slowing down anytime soon. I think Frank Reich is – is a great coach. And, and the big thing is, I mean, the Colts outside of, you know, Quentin Nelson and, you know, Quentin Nelson is great, but outside of maybe Quentin Nelson, maybe Hilton and Darius Leonard up there as well. This team doesn't have many superstars, many, many even stars on this team. Uh, but they, uh, you know, it's kind of like Patriot, like how they come out there every single week and they play better as a collective than they are as individuals. Uh, and I think a lot of that has to go to Frank Reich. I think he's just, uh, he's been a great coach, uh, and been the perfect addition for this franchise. Which is crazy when you think about the fact that, that you know, the whole Josh McDaniels thing and how that turned out. And when yeah. your second option uh, literally outperforms everybody's expectations. Um, yeah, I mean, and then, you know, when you when you look at the team, the Colts itself, and just think about the players, like you're right, like Darius Leonard is a superstar. I don't care what anybody says. Yeah. Uh, he, he's a top five defensive player in this league. And it, he's just going to get better, yeah. which is just remarkable um and then obviously you know it's it's ty he obviously he's so good i mean he's so good but as he's getting older i mean he's what 30 31 yeah i think he's 30 31 yeah he's he's getting up there so he's getting up there the speed will start to slow down but then you know you have malik hooker who we just haven't seen enough of yet Mm -hmm. due to his injuries and then you got pierre desir who you know I don't want to say he's a top five cornerback yet. I would say he's a top 10 corner, but he's definitely like trending in the right direction of superstar. Um, so yeah, I mean, you guys, and then Quentin Nelson, obviously Quentin is just 
a generational talent at guard. Like there's, yeah, there's really nothing else to say about Quentin Nelson. <laughs> um, he's going to be there for 15 years. Um, it's going to be great. Hopefully I'm with the Colts all 15 years too. So I can watch him. That, for, that'd be so <laughs> incredible. Yeah. That'd be incredible. <laughs> like he's, he's so good. Um, all right. So let's get into the game itself. Uh, you know, if you look at the box store box score and didn't watch the game, you would probably think that outside of Jacoby Brissett, if you looked at T.Y. Hilton specifically and said, hey, T.Y. had 76 yards and a TD, you would probably think that the Texans actually won because typically when the Texans lose, it's 197 yards and and two or three TDs. Um, But Pascal, Zach Pascal, just who, I mean, I started to watch because you were mentioning him a lot. Um, And then I also started to watch this because of, you know, he in spurts last year, he was really good. Um, And now, you know, he's starting to evolve and it's kind of crazy because we haven't seen the Devin Funches that you and I were expecting to see Mm -hmm. this season. Like when we talked during the off season, you and I were both like, holy crap. Like we think Devin Funches is going to be a great player for this team, but that just hasn't been the case. No, because he's been on IR since week one. So, uh, you know, it's kind of been tough with that absence. The, The Colts have gone from, all right, we got this rookie in Paris Campbell coming in. We got T.Y. Hilton on the outside still. And then we also got a pretty proven receiver in Devin Funches. Uh, so, they, th- you know, that was a pretty good trio that the Colts were excited about, that we were all excited about. And then, you know, Campbell started slow, and then he had his injury. And then Funches got put on IR after the first week. So it kind of went back to a situation like last year where they just really didn't have the talent at receiver. You know, it was T.Y. Hilton and then a big void of, of guys, just, you know, a six-round pick, uh, Deion Kane trying to get some snaps in there. You had uh, undrafted free agent Zach Pascal coming in. You had Chester Rogers, who's an undrafted free agent a couple years ago. A lot of these guys, I mean, I think Ashton Doolin is on the roster now. Uh, he was an he was an undrafted free agent as well this past season. Uh, so it's a lot of guys who you know late round picks or undrafted guys who are unproven. Uh, but Pascal is the guy who stepped up. I mean, they they gave all the snaps to Kane early. Uh, but Pascal came in and, you know, from run blocking, from doing little things and then just steadily getting better and, and being more consistent. I think uh, he's been a great addition to this team and and he's earned himself a role when when Funchess and Campbell come back. I think uh, this past weekend was a great showing of that. Uh, just overall, just, you know, doing the little things right, uh, running crisp routes and, and catching everything thrown his way. He's He's been a great addition. I totally forgot about Funchess getting hurt. I, yeah. I, I didn't even yeah, think was, about it. It was uh, – I think it was late in that Chargers game. They threw like a fade to him. And he uh, broke his shoulder or something. Mm. Is he going to yeah. be coming back? Yeah, he's going to be their IRDR guy mm. this year. So he's going to come back uh, in two weeks, I believe. He'll be ready for the next Texans matchup, hopefully. Okay. Um, so, you know, with with Pascal having a great game, obviously that catch by Ebron was just yeah. – that was a remarkable catch. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you're right. Like, I expect Marlon Mack to really be the – the offense this week and Frank was like, no, we're, we're lit. We know that their corners are awful and are all hurt. And we're just going to throw the ball all the way around the field. Did you come away from this game feeling better about Brissett as the future? Or are you still kind of in that? Like it was more of a scheme thing. You know, he, he played great, but it was really just more of the game plan and, and, and wide receivers being so open that anybody could have hit him. Yeah, no, it, it was a bit of both. I mean, I don't, I'm not sold yet, obviously, and and uh, actually going back to what you said earlier, you said a lot of Colts fans are probably not sold on him either. Where it's it's pretty shocking how many of them actually are sold on him. Uh, and honestly, you know, when you watch the games, I, I wouldn't even call him one of the more important players in the offense so far. I think he's operating really well in the scheme. And um, you know, we saw that to the max degree this past weekend. Uh, but the reason why I was a little more excited after this past game, and more so than what I was in past weeks, is we just never saw that he could, you know, lead a, a good passing game against, you know, a, a good team and win. You know, like we saw against Atlanta, but Atlanta, you know, the last few weeks has given up, you know, 800 yards passing a game. So it's kind of hard to kind of justify that. And I'm not saying the Texans secondary is any better, but uh-uh. seeing him go into this game against a top tier quarterback, against a top uh, division rival, and the game plan basically be we're going to put everything on your shoulders, you know, to attack downfield, uh, to sit in the pocket against top pressure. How can you perform? And he came out and he delivered well. I mean, uh, there's not much you can look at that performance and say he struggled. Maybe the fourth quarter performance by him uh, is probably where you can really nitpick that he wasn't able to, you know, kind of put the dagger in the Texans. But uh, overall, I mean, it's, it's hard to find many flaws in that game. He operated the scheme well. Guys were open. 
Uh, but he was hanging in there, taking shots. He was uh, creating plays on the run, uh, and, and he got the job done. I mean, AFC Offense Player of the Week, I believe. Uh, and I think he definitely deserved it. He had a great game, and and he's one of the biggest reasons why they won that game. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I think, for, like I said, from, you know, whether it was scheme or, it was, and I think you're right, it's a combination of the two. I mean, you still have to hit the open guys. But, you know, what I saw from Brissett this week from compared to, I think it was either the Chargers game or um, the Raiders game, but um, he looked a lot more comfortable in the pocket this week than he has in, in, yeah. in the past weeks. Um, he was very comfortable stepping up throwing and, and taking the hit it's it, it's almost like he he was okay with it this week compared to weeks past um so yeah he he looked really comfortable i i mean i we've so the texans history with Brissett in general is awful i mean we lost to him yeah. when he was a backup in new england um and then we've lost to him three times now with you guys so i i think that he has the potential to win you guys games especially considering that that defense is continuing to just take steps forward you know, when mm-hmm. you look at what you guys could potentially add next year in the draft and just continue to build on that defense, you know, another pass rusher and that that defense might be like really, really good. What Matt Eberflus has done with that defense. I mean, next year you're going to have Rocky Asin on a second year, you know, coming, you know, his second year playing. He's going to get better. Pierre's always good. Um, you got uh, God, Kenny Moore. Mm-hmm. He's going to be good. Hopefully Malik Hooker can, you know, finally put together a full season. So. I mean, that defense is just, it's its very interesting to see. Oh, yeah, certainly. And then, uh, you know, even on the defensive line, uh, Zanico Autry had a couple pressures yep. this past game. And then, uh, Justin Houston and Jabal Sheard played big roles as well. And also they would get Kamoko Turi back next year, who uh, yep. I believe he had two and a half sacks through four games to start this season before uh, breaking his ankle, unfortunately, at the end of uh, the Chiefs game. But, yeah, and they have a very intriguing defense. And it's actually great to see because those – I think it was the first four games, uh, you know, when the Colts were two and two after the big loss to Oakland. Uh, the defense didn't look great. I mean, they looked terrible against the Chargers. They looked really bad against Oakland. And a lot of people were questioning, you know, Matt Eberflus just kind of playing soft and and not mixing it up. And then these last two weeks against top offenses, uh, they've really come out to play. I mean, I wouldn't say to any degree that they completely shut down Watson no. this past game, but but they played really well. You know, I, I think uh, it's the best you're going to do against you know one of the better quarterbacks in the league is you're not going to shut him down, but you can slow him down. And I think they did just enough to slow him down. Uh, you know, a couple big plays there in the fourth quarter with the the two interceptions. So I think the defense played pretty well. I think they got after him a little bit. I really wish the pass rush would have got home a little bit more. Uh, but I do think, uh, you know, it, it was a good performance all around, and they and they limited one of the better quarterbacks. So uh, this week and then also uh, against the Chiefs two weeks ago, uh, you couldn't ask for more from this defense. Yeah, and and when you look at kind of what they did, uh, it was just a, a, a combination of a lot of different things. Um, when you were watching the film from a defensive scheme perspective, what, what did you see that kind of popped out? So the number one thing that I saw, which I absolutely love that they do, I, I always wonder why teams don't do this more. Uh, whenever you see a weakness on the offensive line or a backup in there, why don't you just attack them as much as possible? And that's what the Colts did. You know, They put Sheard on uh, Roger Johnson, the right tackle, uh, the backup right tackle. I put Sheard on him for most of the game, and Sheard was able to, to – I think he had like three or four run stuffs on the game, knocking uh, Johnson back. Uh, and then he had, uh, I believe, the sack and a couple pressures. Uh, but whenever it was a third down opportunity, what they did is they put Sheard and Houston both on that side uh, just to overload that side with their two best pass rushers. Uh, so I think that created a lot of pressure, especially when Houston was getting nothing done against Laramie Tunsil on the other side. Uh, so I think that was smart scheme-wise. But also, you know, in the secondary, just mixing it up. Uh, it wasn't just straight man all game like it was against the Chiefs. It wasn't just straight zone uh, like they did uh, a lot last year against the Texans. You know, I was I was talking about that before the week, too. You know, you don't want to give Deshaun Watson consistent looks nope. or he's going to make you pay. Never give him consistent looks or he'll start taking advantage of that. You want to mix it up as much as possible, make, sure, like, make him questioning his reads. And I think they did a really good job of that. You know, they were uh, blitzing at times. They were dropping defense alignment into coverages at times. They were... Uh, you know, running zero coverage, they're running prevent coverage. It was a lot of different looks, uh, which kind of had Watson second guessing his first and second reads. And again, Watson played great. He had made a couple great passes, especially that Kenny Stills pass down the sidelines over Rock Yassin. That was, oh my God. I had Colts fans telling me Yassin played that terribly. I'm like, I don't know what you want. He couldn't have done anything. No, like that was, that was a He could have been taller, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe taller than the six foot one corner, whatever he is, six foot corner. Uh, But, 
uh, I think they did a good job limiting Watson to, you know, those couple, uh, you know, three and outs early in the game and, and those two, turno- two turnovers late uh, with really mix- mixing up their uh, pass rush and then just mixing up the coverage as much as possible so he didn't get consistent looks. Yeah, I think, you know, they basically took exactly what they did in the wild card round last last year uh, as far as from the, yeah. the coverage perspective. It was just a combination of zone and man. They were switching back and forth constantly. It really made, I mean, it made Deshaun look, you know, average last year. In the, actually, I would say below average last year in the wild card round. Oh, yeah. This year, it's good to see that, at least from a Texans perspective, that those same looks weren't as troubling for Deshaun as they were last year. So he's taken that next step in development. But, yeah, I mean, I, I think that we kind of, or at least I expected it to be very similar. I mean, the wild card game was his worst game as a pro until the Carolina game. And, yeah. uh the Colts just know what to do to get him second guessing himself. And um, he, he wasn't as comfortable in the pocket. Obviously, you know, the, for some reason, Texans fans thought that we weren't going to give up a sack for the rest of the season, just because we went <laughs> two games without doing it. But uh, uh, I mean, you guys definitely got pressure on him. Um, I would say my favorite part of this game, even though we lost is the watching on tape, um, the DJ reader, Quentin Nelson matchup. I thought that I was from, a, that was from a film perspective, it's, it's about as good of as close to football porn as you can get. I mean, those two, I mean, they're I, I think I think DJ Reed is a top five defensive tackle in the league. And I think now he's starting to get the 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 credit for it. And uh, obviously Quentin Nelson's the best left guard in the league. I really don't think yeah. is that the first time that you could probably say that about a player in their second year? Mahomes, maybe. <laughs> Pat Mahomes well, <laughs> when it comes to yeah. quarterback play. But I don't. Yeah, I don't know, man. I mean, I guess you can still argue Zach Martin. And I always said this all off season when people were were talking to me. You know, if you say Zach Martin, that's fine. Zach Martin might be a Hall of Famer sure. one day. I mean, he's damn good left yep. guard. But I mean, from people who are illiterate about offensive line play and they just see highlights of of pancakes and such, I mean, he's great. But then even when you go to the offensive line guys and you watch his overall games, I mean, he just dominates guys. I remember uh, I had a conversation with Brandon Thorne. Uh, who, if any of you guys uh, don't follow Brandon Thorne on Twitter, definitely give him a follow. He's, he's the best offensive uh, line follow to, to have to ever follow. Yeah, best offensive line and defensive line follow. Uh, really smart guy. But I was talking to him a couple weeks in, and he was saying how Grady, Grady Jarrett was the second best defense tackle in football this year. How Grady Jarrett was having an outstanding season, and I didn't refute him. I just said I, I didn't see Jarrett do much at all against Nelson. He said, "Yeah, nobody is." Yeah. <laughs> it was like nobody is, and I'll even give uh, you know I'll give Reader credit uh, from what, rewatching the game, and I didn't really focus too much on the offensive line, but rewatching the game, especially in uh, run yep. defense, I think Reader was probably his toughest matchup of the year. Uh, Reader's very strong, very uh, low center of gravity, uh, so guys like Grady uh, Grady Jarrett Nelson was able to kind of move pretty easily. Reader he was he was struggling to get some ground on him, and it was a good matchup. You know there was there were some reps that Nelson really won, uh, definitely some reps that that Reader won. I think that was a uh, that was a really good heavyweight fight. So I, I really like that matchup. I got to go back and rewatch it with more of a, a focus on those yeah. two. Uh, I'm excited to see what Brandon says because Brandon left, uh, I think, so he did his rankings before the season started for uh, defensive linemen um, and left uh, Reader out. Basically, he was like the bottom tier. And I was kind of surprised because I, I, I expected Brandon to really like pay attention to kind of when he, where he was putting Reader. But um a lot of it, and then I was talking to Brendan about it, and he said, well, it's because he's not a three-down player. Well, it's funny that he says that because this year he's a three-down player every down, so or every series. So yeah. um, it's nice that Re- Reader's taking that next step. Um, so, I mean, from a Colts perspective now, I mean, what are the expectations moving forward? I mean, you guys have beat two really good teams. Um you know, you struggled against the Raiders, but I, I almost wonder if like the Raiders game is, I would say an anomaly, but I also think that the Raiders caught them off guard. I don't think people really expected the Raiders to be, I don't think they're a great team, but I think they're a competitive team. Uh, Carr's probably playing yeah. the best he's played in his career. Um, you know, John Gruden's doing, it, it, you, you're not seeing it a lot, but Gruden's really doing a good job with that team considering what they went through in the off season and, you know, everything that they've traded away you know, he's rebuilding that team his way and they, they look like a really, you know, competitive team at least. Yeah. I mean, at worst they're, you know, they're going to be a seven to nine win team. So I, I, I think losing 
to that team. And it was basically a one score. I think it was only a one score loss because they had that garbage yep. touchdown to the Colts at the end. You know, a one score loss to a team that's pretty competitive. You know, I don't think that's too like debilitating. And obviously it wasn't. They came back and beat the Chiefs in Arrowhead and then beat the Texans at home. Uh, but going forward, I mean, the Colts have four games here coming up. I think three of them are at home, one's on the road. It goes Broncos, Steelers, Dolphins, uh, someone else really bad um, in there as well. I can't remember who the fourth one is, but uh, they have four really, really winnable games. Uh, so, oh, I think Jaguars are the other one, so maybe not really bad team. They're mm. okay, but um, like they're, I think Foles will be back for that game at least. If we'll see starts. what he's got, but. If he starts, yeah, Minshew Magic throwing <laughs> for 150 yards and taking six sacks He's Case game. Keenum. Can, yeah, can can we talk about like I know it's not even yeah. on like Minshew Magic? Where where the hell? I mean, he had like three good plays in in a four game stretch, and he was throwing like a hundred yards and fumbling twice a game, and people were going crazy. Like, don't get me wrong, I met Gardner Minshew down at Senior Bowl last year. Nice guy. His hands are bigger than his whole body. His hands are literally the hands of like seven footers. But um, yeah, no, I don't get it. Like he he didn't do it's his persona. <laughs> Uh, he's an American superhero. I mean, he he people love the stash, his look, his charisma and in interviews. Like and and he won him a big game, you know, on Thursday night against the Titans. He had his whole family there. The they went the, against the Mariota right, Titans. Right. But like a division rival <laughs> on Thursday night, Dion and Michael Irvin were there. They interviewed M- Minshew for like 40 minutes and he was just so captivating. People just he he's basically What's funny about this is his personality is so similar to Blake Bortles. People don't seem to realize it. Like he is literally Blake Bortles <laughs> personality wise. And then from a football perspective, his ceiling is Case Keenum. Yeah, which is yeah. fine. Like don't get like like Case Keenum's, you know, if if every undrafted free agent turned to Case Keenum, that's fine. Like that's a great sure. career. Case Keenum is going to retire with having a great freaking great career. Money. But yeah, but like, come on, <laughs> Minshew magic. This like, and don't even get me wrong. I don't even think Foles is that good. I don't think Foles. Is that I good would at stick all. with Minshew. Like he had a couple. Of good- yeah, I mean, probably stick with Minshew. Why not? Because I mean, at least you're yep. winning with him, and he's not showing bad things. Like I'm not trying to talk trash about him. Like he's not. But I mean, he's he's not the guy. No, I agree. <laughs> like, and it's funny on. because like <laughs> you know he's not the guy, but I think you could win with him if Jacksonville had every piece on defense that they started the season with. Yeah. But now that they've traded yeah. two big defensive players uh, off their team, now it's almost like, are they folding on the season? Because I mean, without Ramsey and, and Yangakwe, like I, I really don't know how this team is going to compete. Like not that Yangakwe is uh, like a top 10 defensive lineman, but he's a pretty good defensive lineman. Uh, probably the best on a lot of teams in, in the NFL. Yeah, no, I don't know. I I don't think Jacksonville's a very good team. I think they have a decent coach. Like, I don't think he's that bad. I don't think their management's very good at all. Uh, but you know, Minshew's fine. You know, for like you said, I think Case Keenum's a really good comparison for him. But at the end of the day, you know, a, a noodle arm quarterback who is really short and frazzled in the pocket a little. I mean, he he steps up pretty well. And yeah. He takes hits, but you know, he he gets us happy feet in the pocket. He's got a noodle. I mean, overall, you're not gonna. That's not sustainable, but um, anyway, I know he also we kind has of no weapons. Away. Going back to, yeah, no weapons either. Like I don't know. I guess Fournette's having a decent year, but is it going to last though? But right, it's not. Fournette. He's not. Very, he's not. He's no, not he's, not. <laughs> he's not. He's um, not. <laughs> oh yeah. man! Uh, but going back to the Colts, uh, these next four games. Uh, so they have you know Minshew's magic coming up. Uh, I think that they're the fourth game in the stretch, but they have the Steelers with their third or fourth string quarterback. Uh, I think they the only road game is at the Dolphins, but is that really like, you know, no one's going no. that game. Uh, and then they have the a home game this upcoming weekend against the Broncos who have like the worst offensive line and quarterback yep. in the league. Uh, so the Colts can, you know, they can move to eight and two here over these next four games. And, you know, that's, that's incredible. You know, if I would have told you, you know, Andrew Luck's going to retire one week before the season, but the Colts will still go eight and two to start the year. Like that's incredible. Uh, so, you know, eight and two, seven and three. That's really realistic right now. Uh, like it's not even like you know optimistic. No, you should it's just lock it probably what's gonna happen. Yeah, you should basically lock in, especially with Frank Reich. And you know, if it was any other coach, uh, I would say maybe you'll have like a letdown game or two in there. And to a degree, the Raiders game earlier this year was kind of a letdown game. But you know, with, with Frank Reich, I don't really think he's gonna let these guys 
you know, slip again. So I think these next four games, uh, they'll at least win three of them, if not win all four uh, and move to eight and two. And I think that's that's huge. I mean, if you're at eight, eight and two through 10 games, I mean, you're pretty much locked into the playoffs. So I think it's pretty possible to see this team in the playoffs. And, you know, they might make some make a run because, I mean, they they're not this great team uh, or they're not this great, like, collection of individuals they're a really good team though you know they they just understand how to play together they play up to the collective very well and and I think that's the type of team that scares you in the playoffs they might not have elite quarterback or an elite defense or anything but uh the way they all play together and they just find ways to win I think that's a that's a scary team yeah I I I think that I agree I think that they have a chance to 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 make a run especially with the way that they play uh and then having Frank Wright you know being able to scheme wins like and that's literally what he can do with his game plans um, the, those are the type of teams that you don't want to actually play in the playoffs because you just don't know what to expect. Oh yeah. Um, they kind of remind me of like Minnesota, uh, not last year, but the year before where, you know, they were, they had the Minnesota miracle and things like that. Like that was with case Keenum. I think Jacoby Brissett's a better quarterback than, than case Keenum. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I would agree eight and two Justin Houston's going to feast in Denver. It's like if, if anybody oh, plays an IDP league, like I guarantee you, Justin Houston's a free agent. Like, go pick him up and start him immediately because it's either going to be B- Garrett Garrett Bowles, who is like a literal walking holding penalty, and then uh, who's the other tackle? Is it? Yeah. I don't even know. Did, did you see the? Did, have you seen Garrett Bowles' nickname no. from no. Broncos Twitter? Garrett. Oh, Holt. See, that makes total sense. Poor Brandon, <laughs> like who who like loves watching offensive linemen like in every day. He has to break down like film breakdowns for the Broncos. Like that's got to be yeah. that, like that's the worst. That's like working at an IT company, but or be wanting to work in IT and you work at Best Buy. Like, yeah, I mean, and they have uh, the best one of the best offensive line coaches in history. It, I it, mean, we're talking about Mike Munchak's there. Like that's, I mean, this guy is stuck. Like almost got head coaching jobs because he's such a damn good offensive I line wanted coach. Him. And he actually, yeah, I mean, yeah, of course, who wouldn't want him? He's a damn yeah. good coach. Uh, and he can't even turn that team around. I mean, or turn that offensive line around. It's it's just brutal. The offensive line's bad. I, I had so much hope for Garrett Bowles coming into this year with uh, with Munchak, but it just hasn't worked no. out at all. It, it, the the I do like Dalton Reisner though. Oh yeah, he's great. He was a great Dalton interview Reisner. too. He's, he's a great kid. Um, but yeah, uh, all right. So eight and two, ten games in. I mean, that likely means that you guys will finish. 11 and 5 11 or 10 I mean honestly yeah I mean if they're 8 and 2 I I don't envision them winning winning less than 10 games uh cuz I think they have a kind of tough stretch down the end of the year you know they have the Texans again uh Titans which are we don't even know what they're no. going to be at that point uh Jaguars again and then uh, I believe it's Saints Breeze will be back somebody Yeah Breeze will be back so that's going to be a really tough game um, I think there's one more that's kind of uh, you guys don't play there, the Patriots, but, you know. Mm. No, not this year. Nope, because uh, we didn't. Technically, we didn't win the uh, division, right? You guys won. So yeah, we play the Patriots. Year, it's awful. Yeah, and this year's going to be the worst. I love it. Yeah, Patriots. Defense, I can't wait man. to watch what Patriots that, that, defense does to Baker Mayfield this week. It's going to be. It's, <laughs> oh yeah, you're rebel. I hate. That yeah, shit. yeah, yeah. I hate. I hate Baker Mayfield more than I hate like m- like <laughs> mowing my grass. Like I, I, I hate Baker Mayfield. And what they did to Sam Darnold, I, I think, is going to be amplified. And then, did you see that uh, Jarvis Landry came out today and said that he guarantees they're going to win? <laughs> well, so they've been they've been playing cleanup like crazy on that shit. If you've seen like NFL Network, there's like something released every ten what? minutes about uh about like the browns like uh going back on that statement and then here's what landry really said and here's interpreting it in different ways like it's it's crazy like i've never seen so much cover up just for a statement we're gonna win like i want my players to say that going into a game you know like i I want my players to say we're gonna win i don't want them to come out and rebuttal yeah i would um, rather not (laughs) rebuttal. i I would rather just like (laughs) basically double stamp it and make sure that that's out there but if you're going to basically what they said they said he said we're gonna win, and then the clarification was he meant we're going in there with the intention of winning. Like we're going in there to win. Like we're not going oh, there wow. not to win. That's basically, a, that's even worse. Which, you know, yeah, it's just Browns can't get anything stupid. right. Not even talking trash. Nope. No. Well, Baker's good at talking trash at least. Yeah, but uh, he, I mean, he hasn't been the last two trash. weeks. 
He hasn't said anything. <laughs> He's good at playing. He's yeah. been awful this year. <laughs> uh, all right, Zach. So yeah, I guess before we get out of here and let you get back to your day, um, what did you see on tape from the Texans that, that kind of you know made you – like I, I know you respect the Texans. I know you respect the, the players that we have, and I know you you know that we have a good team. Um, you know, we talked in lengths about potentially Bob holding us back in the last um, time we talked. But I mean, what did you see yeah. from the Texans this week when you were watching film that you were kind of like, okay, maybe you know things are going in the right direction? Yeah. So I, I will start off by saying that I will kind of be the crow a little bit because even though I respect the the Texans and I respect Watson, Hopkins, all those guys. Uh, coming to this year, I wasn't super high on them, uh, and, and stupidly, I was a little bit higher on the te- on the Titans because I just thought their overall team was better. But I, f- I guess I just didn't take into account how bad their quarterback play was going to be this year. Uh, but going back to the Texans, uh, they they've surprised me in a lot of areas. You know, uh, the Tunsil trade was crazy value. You know, it was it was pretty crazy value. But you know, when you look at it on the field, the on the field product of that, I mean, they have. A great left tackle. I mean, a, a superstar left tackle. I saw this past weekend. I mean, I, I knew Laramie Tunsil was really good, uh, but the way that he was just handling Justin Houston left and right was really impressive. Uh, and the rest of their offensive line didn't look that bad. I mean, outside of the backup right tackle. Uh, so that that area really impressed me. I think Deshaun Watson has grown a lot as a passer. Uh, and kind of like what you said earlier, I think uh, from from that playoff game to this one, he basically saw the exact same coverage, it, even with the Colts having a little bit better of a defense now. He saw the same kind of things, and you could tell that he was getting better with that with that process and and kind of attacking it better. So I think Watson's improved quite a bit. Uh, I really love Kenny Stills on the outside. I think he was he was excellent all game. Uh, and then on defense, I think uh, you know that that pass rush is still really good. Uh, J.J. Watt looked like his old self. Uh, I mean, there was moments last year where yep. he didn't look like that, but whew, I mean, he looked. I mean, he. I mean, they they did a good job at lining up against uh, Glowinski for most of the game and and uh, getting him in favorable positions against Braden Smith. But uh, he looked really good. D.J. Reader really impressed me. Uh, the linebackers really impressed me. Uh, so overall, I was really impressed by this Texans team. Uh, I think that you know the penalties and and all that kind of stuff were a little um, egregious and overblown, and there was a couple of of bad discipline things. I don't know if you kind of throw that at the head coach. I mean, I know definitely know some people will, but there's definitely flaws like that. And there were some, some, you know, just uh, shooting themselves in the foot, but they're a really talented football team. Uh, and I, I think I slept on that a little bit going into the year. Uh, you know, I, I always accounted for Watson being very good and Hopkins being very good. JJ Watt being very good, but seeing the other guys, you know, Tunsil playing great. Kenny Stills playing great. Uh, seeing DJ Reader playing great, Zach Cunningham, I think that's that's really good. I mean, it's it's a really good formula for success. So maybe they're not a perfect team right now. The secondary still needs some work. Uh, even the overall depth needs a little work and, and not shooting themselves in the foot. But uh, this is definitely a playoff team. I mean, when you have a quarterback playing like Watson and and you have a, a team that's playing as well as they are, I, I think they're going to be fine in the long term. They, they should make the playoffs. Yeah, I would agree. Year. I think with the secondary too, we, me and John were talking about it the other day, well, you know, after or last night after uh, – the Gary and Connolly trade, uh, who, who I'm extremely high on. Um, oh, I, dude, I had him as a ninth overall player in that draft, dude. I loved I, him coming out. He's, he's exactly so what we need to. Like he, I was telling John, he's yeah. basically Bradley Roby, but just a little bit more physical. Um, and he has a little, he has more yeah, recovery longer. speed than Roby. Uh, I mean, talking about 44 inch right. arms, six three, like ran mm-hmm. a four four at the combine. Um, and when you watch what he did to you guys, this, you know, when you guys played, I think he was targeted six times and only allowed six yards when he plays man and he's allowed to be himself. He's a really good corner. And I think I think this trade oh, is going to end up being one yeah. of those things where people look back and be like, wow, I can't believe you guys got him for a third round pick, considering we still have this year and then two more after this, considering the, the fifth year option. And then once Roby comes back from his injury, probably after the bye, So, you know, week 10, uh, week 11. And then Lonnie Johnson is developing. He's a rookie, but he's developing. And at times he looked he looked good this week. Mm-hmm. When you have those three pieces in the secondary, I think we'll we'll be okay. Uh, I, I think we can turn it around this season and really make the difference that we need to make. But I love Gary and Conley. I think he's going to be a stud. Oh yeah, I do. I completely forgot that he went to the Texans. I I mean, you know, the Colts writer in me hopes he's not a stud, but oh, dude, the draft guy in me, I hope he finally pans out because. I mean, I, I fell in love. Like, he's one of my favorite prospects I've ever watched. I mean, that length and that speed, uh, just so good. I mean, he just never really had the confidence or he's never really put in great positions there in Oakland. 
I mean, if you guys let him kind of get in that press, I mean, he did good against T.Y. Hilton yeah. in, that, in the, the Raiders game. If you guys let him get in press and let him be comfortable in that, I mean, he, yeah, he's going to be He's just got to learn to tackle. He, he, he's definitely yeah, scared to tackle. A lot of um, but, yeah. So, I, and then I think when you add Justin Reed to that, you know, I think Justin Reed's a really good safety. I just think with the – Mm-hmm. the lack of corners right now. Like, I think it's really hard to be a good safety when you don't have good corners around you. Like, yeah. There's just really nothing Absolutely. you can do. And uh, you're trying to make up for everything else that's going on on the back end. And you really can't get comfortable. And then when you lose to Sean Gibson against you guys, which to Desha- Sean's actually been really freaking good for us. I think we're number one against tight ends coming into this last week. Um, yeah, he's a smaller guy, but he's competitive. He gets in there again with those yeah, tight ends. Exactly. So uh, I think it'll be interesting. Uh, we I think we meet after our bye on Thursday night football. I think it's week eleven. Yeah, it's always. I think yeah, I think it's prime time Thursday yeah. night. I believe. Yep. So we'll right. we'll see. I'm sure we'll we'll talk at the, at that time. But um, all right, Zach, I'm gonna let you get back to your day. Tell the listeners one more time where they can find you, and I'm sure we will talk in the next coming weeks. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, if you guys want to follow me, uh, go on uh, Twitter at Zach Hicks too. Uh, talk a lot of Colts, but you know, if you guys want to talk some Texans, especially Gary and Conley, I mean, I would love to talk some Gary and Conley. Um, I'm probably famous, mostly famous through Texans Twitter for my hate of Dante <laughs> Foreman. <laughs> I can't. I got a lot of crap for for that this off season. Even I think his dad came after me. Uh, oh yeah, dude, his yeah. dad was a yeah. dick. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, for all of you Texans fans who weren't spurned by that, uh, you know, at Zach Hicks too on Twitter, um, uh, always love a good conversation. I mean, we talk on there quite a bit, uh, even if it's Colts or, or just NFL stuff. I mean, always down for a good conversation. Absolutely. Uh, well, awesome. Well, thanks Zach. And we'll catch you next time. Loved this episode of Texans unfiltered. We'd love for you to be a Patreon supporter. Your support allows us to provide you with the best Texans podcast possible. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Houston FB pod and everywhere podcasts can be found and join our community on www.texansunfiltered.com or on discord at Texans unfiltered. Thank you for listening until next time.